Is it off? There it is. I said it might work. How about this one? I'm going to hook this one up too. And uh, that I'll be able to speak to you in stereo this morning. And, uh, and uh, boy, it's going to be a great day. And uh, I think, honestly, this is the first time I've ever been in a lock boat when it was warm and sunny. And every time I, I, I promise you, last year I got off the plane and uh, came here. It was pouring down rain. Uh, it was cold out. The guy said, you should have been here last week. It was incredible. I hear that every time I go. Uh, we made a week earlier. Next week, uh, people are going to say, should have been here last week. Amen? Uh, but we'll already be here. Looking forward to a great time together. Uh, last week, they were in the breakfast room at the hotel every day, all these golfers. And I, I mean, they were talking about two and three inches of rain. And I said, what are you going to do? Uh, you need some scuba equipment so you can hit the ball. But uh, this week looks like it's going to be warm and sunny. I I call this revival weather. Hey. Hey. Amen. It, it means that you and I are really without excuse to be in the house of God right. and uh, looking forward to it. Don't even think about getting sick this week. Uh, it's too nice to be sick. And, uh, now, if it, was, if it was raining and cold, that'd be one thing, but it's not. And uh, just so glad to be back here with you in a lot of uh, I love this church. love the people in it. Uh, love your pastor. Love, uh, just love everything God's doing here. And I uh, told my son Lewis, I said, son, this is not the biggest church in America, but it sure is great. Hey. And, uh, it's a good place. And God's working here. People are getting saved. Uh, the Lord's dealing. And uh, just a good place to be. So uh, let's turn in our Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And I'd like to look at, in that chapter of the Bible. And I'd like to look, beginning uh, to read in verse number 24. You know, this morning I thought, now, did Brother Zeri tell me that I'm speaking in Sunday school or not? Uh, am I preaching in Sunday school today? But you know, you got to be ready to preach, pray, sing, or die in a moment's notice. Amen. So I got myself ready. I thought, you never know, uh, they might just call on me, so I'll be ready just in case they do. You may have told me, and I forgot all about it. Uh, probably you didn't because you're more forgetful than me. Say amen to that. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, he probably uh, told me that and I forgot. But I wasn't sure, but I got ready just in case today. We had a great time last night with the young preacher boys, and they, uh, uh, they all preached and tried to uh, make an attempt at learning how to be preachers, and uh, that was exciting. Had some of the girls, they preached a little bit last night. Well, not really. They, uh, they should have been here to learn how to be preacher wives. Amen? Uh, but we are having a great time. Appreciate these young guys. And uh, they're off to a good start. And uh, they preached their sermons. We gave them some instruction, a little bit of help. Uh, and we called it critiquing. Amen? How many of you know this was a great difference between criticizing and critiquing? What's criticizing do? What's the duty? It tears you down. What's critique, what's critique do? It builds you up. It, you up. it helps you out. And, uh, so that's why we had it and uh, had a great time again. Uh, today is a championship football Sunday. NFC championship is on, I guess, at 12 o'clock. Wouldn't that be a hilarious if the Arizona Cardinals won uh, the NFC championship? It would be even better if the Baltimore Ravens stopped them in the Super Bowl. And uh, one of these men back here is a Pittsburgh fan. You pray for him. Uh, we'll have to pray for him tonight. Don't leave the church over the fact that the Ravens are going to hammer the Steelers tonight. <laughs> All right. Matthew chapter number 6. Matthew chapter 6. And uh, let's look at verse number 24. It's a little warm in here. Is it just me? Just a little warm. Some of you say, no, it's just warming up. How many are uh, hot? How many are cold? How many are lukewarm? All right. <laughs> uh, Matthew chapter 6. And uh, I want us to look at verse number 24 together. Verse number 24. And we'll start our reading right there. No man can serve two masters. Rather, he will hate the one, love the other. Or else you will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, what ye shall drink, yet nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father, uh, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much more better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? Why take ye thought for the morrow? For the 
And why, or why take you thought, excuse me, for Raven? How, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, <coughs> O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewith shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. Look at verse 33. Read it out loud together, please. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. For a few moments this morning, in the Sunday school hour, and I'll add to this a little bit later and again tonight, I want to speak for a little while about making Jesus first for 2009. What does it really mean to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness? What does it really mean to say, Lord, you're not only going to be prominent in my life, but for this coming year, I want you to be preeminent. How many want Christ to be preeminent in your life? That means He holds entire first place in everything you do. And for a few moments, let's consider that subject of how to make Jesus first in your life for this coming year. Let's pray. Father, the text this morning was a part of what is known as the Sermon on the Mount. Study your Bible in Matthew 5, verse, and through Matthew chapter 7, and then several other portions of Scripture that are like it. The Lord was standing on this sermon uh, in the Mount of Olives, and He begins to give out what is known as the Beatitudes. He begins to speak the Word of God to them and teach them God's principles and God's uh, really demands for those people who will live their lives as a child of God. And He gives out what is known as this kingdom living uh, chapter of the Bible. Now here in chapter 5, beginning in verse number 24, he deals with this subject of learning to live with a singular heart. Not uh, living with the dilemma of a divided heart, but rather uh, the blessings of a singular heart toward God. You know that most of us, most of our troubles come from living a distracted life. God's looking for some people who will live singularly for the glory of God and say, Lord, by Your grace and by Your power, I will give You everything that I have. Now he begins to deal with this issue in verse number 24 of mastery. He says, no man can serve what? Verse number 24, no man can serve what? Two masters. You cannot live your life trying to serve two masters. You say, what do you mean by that? If you're working at a job, if you're going to be successful in that job, you must give your life to that job. Now, when you show up, some of you men are in the military, you don't go to the military and go into the office at 7.30 or 7 o'clock in the morning and show up while you're there at your desk. Uh, you're also playing Nintendo, and you've got the Wii going on up against the wall, and you've got a little solitaire game on your computer, and uh, over here you've got this and that and the other. You're there to do business. You're there uh, to accomplish your task at hand. And it's the same uh, with any area of life. You cannot serve two masters. Listen to what he said. If you try to serve two masters, in verse number 24, he said he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and what? It's the Sunday school on what you respond. You cannot serve God and mammon. The word mammon is an interesting word in your Bible. It is a word that means literally uh, the world. Or you can't serve God and, and the established kingdoms of this world at the same time. Now Jesus said in another portion of Scripture that you're in the world, but you're not what? Help me. You're in it, but you're not of it. So sometimes it could seem that God is contradicting Himself. We're supposed 
supposed to love sinners. Amen to that? And we're supposed to not love the world. He said, love not the world, neither things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. He's saying to us, of course we're supposed to love lost sinners, but we're not supposed to love this cosmos world system of which they're a part. In other words, we're, uh, we have money, but we're not supposed to what? Help me. We're not supposed to love money. For the love of money is the what? Does that mean we're supposed to be poor and broke? Does it mean that we're not supposed to accumulate anything? Well, I'll never save a penny, amen. I'm not going to have a 401. I'm not going to have a retirement program because I hate money. That's not what that means. It means we're supposed to love God with all of our heart, soul, and mind, but we're not supposed to love and to accumulate uh, this world's good. We ought to have enough to survive. We ought to have enough to serve Christ with. We ought to have enough to meet the needs of others, but not love it uh, with our heart. We can cannot serve God and mammon. I heard the true story of two men sitting on a, a country road, sitting there on, on a bench. Uh, they were waiting for a bus to come by and take them into town. They watched as a, a man walked uh, down a country road. It was actually two men walking together, and they had a beautiful dog following from behind. One of them said, I wonder whose dog that is. And uh, the other one said, we'll find out in a minute. Because they're going to hit that fork in the road. And I guarantee you, if they split, uh, the dog is always going to follow his master. Sure enough, they, they went different directions. The dog followed the man who obviously was his master. And what if that dog following his owner, God wants us to follow Christ in everything we do. Do I have an amen to that? He wants us to glorify his name. Oh, I have this on but I'm not on. There we go. Somebody let me know. You're all looking at me, but you're just letting me uh, be off. How about now? Is this, this one on? No, sir. Uh, go ahead, speak. How about now? You're good. Yeah. This one's on? Yes, sir. It's on. Hey, all right, good. You know what this means? That's Baltimore Ravens are going to win the AFC Championship. <laughs> <laughs> that's the yeah, anyway, uh, you know, that's not on my mind at all. But anyway, uh, folks, uh, you cannot serve the masters. You can't, you can't serve two at the same time. And so he made it very clear in verse number 25, now he begins to define exactly what he's talking about. He said, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Now, I know people would take this verse very, very literally. They're just thoughtless idiots. Amen? That's not what God is speaking about. Hey, he's not talking about living your life like a carefree fool. Uh, that's what a fool is, is a carefree person. Biblically, according to the book of Proverbs, he's not talking about just walking around and doing whatever you want. Blah, 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 blah. I don't care. Who cares? Take no thought for your life. That's not what he's saying here. He said, he begins to define this. Take no thought for your life, saying what? What shall we what? Eat. Or what shall we what? Drink. Drink. Nor yet for your body. What shall you put on? And he said for, uh, it, it's not life more than meat and the body than raiment. You don't have to spend your time and occupying your thoughts with what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to put on, another portion of Scripture, how much you're going to make. I can assure you, in the next uh, hour of life, you will think about several things at least one or two times. You will think about every one of these issues uh, during the next 24 hours. You say, what are they? You will think about food. Amen. Amen. Amen to that. Sometime in the next 24 hours, you will think about food. You don't have to conjure it up. You don't have to say, hmm, I think I'm going to, I'm going to try to get some thoughts of food going on in my mind. You young guys think about food about every 10 minutes. Any of you in junior high, any of the junior high, middle school, you think about food about every half hour. We can fill you up now, half an hour from now, you'll be thinking, hmm, pizza. Hamburgers, spaghetti. Uh, you'd be thinking about uh, about three o'clock. You think about cereal. How many of you grew up when you were uh, when you were kids? You used to have a cereal attack in the afternoon, brother. I'd get home from school, frosted flakes, had to have some uh, fruit loops. Had to uh, uh, that's what you eat, not what you are. So you meant that. Uh, fruit loops and uh, or uh, uh, rice krispies, whatever with sugar on them. Uh, it was always something. Captain Crunch, and, and I'd think about some cereal in the afternoon. Nobody had to make me think about. That, that automatically came to mind. 
what you're going to eat, what you drink. He said, for your body, what you'll put on. And so, uh, people in this room, especially ladies, you're going to be thinking about clothes sometimes this afternoon. You're going to think about, where, what am I going to wear tonight? What kind of attire will I have on? What will I wear tomorrow? Clothing is such an important issue. And by the way, you ought to think about it some. Amen. 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 So you should not take this verse literally. Obviously, by the way that you just threw stuff on. Now, matching doesn't, uh, you know, blue with green and everything else. And uh, I mean, we ought to think a little bit about it. But he said, don't let this occupy your life. What you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to put on. Don't let money occupy your life. You're going to think about money automatically. How do you think that sometime today, money will go through your mind? It will. It will automatically go through your mind. Let's go out to eat. Boom. How much money do I have? Uh, let's, let's go out to eat. We did that last night. That's too much money. Uh, let's, uh, what are we going to do tomorrow? I don't know. How am I going to get to work? I need gas money. We're always thinking about money. And he said to us, all these things that the Gentiles seek after. He said lost people have these things on their mind. Lost people automatically think about clothing. They automatically think about food. They automatically think about water, what they're going to drink. They automatically think about uh, growing. He said uh, uh, adding to their stature. Lost people think about how uh, they're in shape and all this and that and the other. I had a woman say, Preacher, I'm going to have a curvy coat bottle figure. Good for you. It's going to be a two liter one of these days. Anyway, it's all uh, going to grow out. So you might do that. But uh, I hope you can retain your looks as long as you can. But that's not what life is all Amen. about. He said the body and your life is more than these. In other words, my life is not all about food. Life is not all about money. Life is not all about having the latest cool stuff to wear. Life is not all about what kind of a car you can drive. I've met people that have all that fancy cars, fancy clothes, fancy stuff, and you think, boy, if I could just be like them, do you know that people in Hollywood, California right now are rolling over for the first time from a night of misery and drunkenness and sin and don't even know what they did, and there are people in some of the highest uh, palatial homes in this state that the world looks at, lifestyles of the rich and famous, they don't talk about how many pills it took them just to get to sleep, mm -hmm. they don't talk about the fact that their kids are anorexic and, and living with bulimia and cutting themselves and, th and having thoughts of suicide. They don't know that those people that are the uh, world's elite spend millions and even billions of dollars collectively on psychiatric care right. because their minds are twisted. Right. They're not happy. Do I have yeah. that? Yeah. And Jesus yeah. said that none of these things are really your life. That's not the real you. That's right. The real Britney Spears. It's not the ones you see under the lights. The real Justin Timberlake is not the one you see out on the stage. The real, uh, your favorite actor, I don't care who it is, uh, the real, uh, I got a guy in my mind that I can't think of him because I don't really care that much about him. The real Brad Pitt is not the one who's on the Entertainment Weekly. The real Brad Pitt has to wake up in the morning and look in the mirror just like you and I do. And I can say to you this morning, what they see looking back is not as glamorous and beautiful and pleasing as it is on the stage. Right. They're miserable. Well, how many men do they have? That's why the marriages only last usually a year or two. That's why they find out that their wife's been cheating on them or the husband's got two mistresses on the side. They are miserable. That's why they have to sign prenuptial agreements before they make a covenant. I mean, friends, have you ever heard of such a day? We have to say, I'm going to make this covenant with you, but in case I decide to end it, let's sign prenuptial agreements because this covenant means nothing to me. Do you have an amen? Good. And he said, don't let these things rule and drive and control your life. Right. Then he said to us, in, uh, let's skip down some. He said in verse number 31, what should you eat? Take no thought. What should we drink? Then he said, all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of what? Amen. God knows all of our needs. Amen. He knows our needs Amen. better than we do. Right. You right. know what you want, but God knows what you need. Amen. Amen. How many you raised some children? I see some of you are certainly of age where you've raised some up. You say, well, I did. Actually, they raised me. But uh, they teach you a lot of things. 
Uh, my youngest son, Lewis, is here. He'll be back in school uh, out here um, in, at Bible College in a few days. And, uh, and we've watched them grow up. And I, I think about uh, when Lewis was a little boy, he wanted lots of stuff. As a matter of fact, little kids want everything they see. Amen? I mean, they take a penny and they say, ah, ah, they want to stick it in the electric socket and uh, see what happens. And he did that one time. And a, and a, I mean, a copper penny and electric socket is not a good combination. I mean, man, his hair still sticking up from it. But I mean, uh, is that what happened, Rosier? All right. Anyway, uh, I mean, folks, uh, you and I uh, we understand that we, all of us, our kids do things uh, that they should not do. They live by what they want, yes, but right. the parents know what they need. Amen. Now, these children, if you had your way, you'd eat ice cream and candy bars and lollipops, three meals a day. I mean, that's what you would eat. Lollipops in the morning, ice cream for lunch, and then you'd have had uh, some kind of uh, other uh, concoction for dinner, and you'd have died from malnutrition. Mom and Dad were there saying, eat this broccoli. I hate broccoli. You eat broccoli. I hate broccoli. <laughs> eat the broccoli. It's amazing. When they sit on that high chair for three days and can't get up, their appetites do change. Amen? <laughs> But you, you've got to, uh, our job is to train them and teach them what's right, not what they want, but what you need. Amen. He said, your heavenly Father knoweth you have need of all these things. He said, but rather than seeking for money, rather than seeking for fame, rather than seeking for all the things of the world, he said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness then he said, a few of these things shall be added unto you. Is that what he said? No. Now, some of these things shall be added unto you. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That means everything you need has been promised by God if you and I will just seek Him first. Good. Yeah. I want to give you a very simple outline this morning. Once you take it home with you, keep it, write it down in your Bible somewhere. Uh, years ago, I, I read the life story of a, he was an entrepreneur, a Christian entrepreneur. His name uh, was Arthur S. DeMoss. He was one of the most wealthy Christian men uh, that ever graced the planet. God used him in a great way. He started selling insurance when he was just a young man, and he based his life on three or four very simple principles, and he wrote a small booklet that I read years ago of how God used him uh, to build a multi-billion dollar empire, and as a result of his empire, he now, to this day, he's been dead for many years, yet his empire and his foundation is still financing works like this, and financing ministries and Bible colleges around the globe because of simply putting God to the test and, and trusting God for this verse. Matthew 6, 33 became his life verse. And it was, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And Mr. DeMoss said, From now on, I will constantly uh, put these principles at work in my life. He did, and as a result, by the time he died, he was living off 1% of his total income. He was taking 1%. God was getting 99% of his total income uh, because of the life he had lived faith based on Matthew 6.33. Very simple. I'll give it to you when we're done. Number one, and he, he said these principles will guide my life. Before I give you the first principle, when a principle guides your life, may I ask you what that means? What does it mean when a principle guides your life? If you have a principle in force in your life, May I ask you, will that principle change? Will that principle change? Will life change? Will circumstances change? But when you have a principle that's guiding your life, your guiding principle never changes. And he said, these are the things that I will do no matter what the circumstance, no matter what the cost. And I want to give you five or six, four or five things of what he said, this is how I will make Christ first in my life. Number one, he said, I'm going to give to God the first day of every week. Did you hear me? The first day of every week. 
You go home and read 1 Corinthians 16, 12, 1, 16, verse 1 and 2. And God said on the first, said on the first day of every week, as you're gathered together, He said, let there be a collection given. It was clear after the resurrection of Christ that the Sabbath day, which was always Saturday, uh, the last day of the week, became what? It became the Lord's day. And on what day is the Lord's day? Sunday. It's Sunday. It's the first day of the week. And the men of God through the ages have always said, in order for God to have His way, we're going to give Him the first day of the week. Young yeah. people, I remember Sundays you couldn't even buy, you couldn't buy a loaf of bread growing up. There was no options where to eat. That's why people ate in their home back then. So you remember that? We actually ate home. I remember the first prime rib I ever ate out of my house I was 22 years old in Bible college. You say, Preacher, you were neglected. Not one bit. Are you kidding me? I ate spaghetti, uh, raviolis. I had manicotti made at home. I had uh, all kinds of good stuff. My mama, uh, she knew how to cook, brother. And I'm not talking about beat something against the wall and throw it into the microwave or zip something open and put it out on the plate. She knew how to cook. Somebody say amen. I know that's a bad word, but uh, understand uh, it was a different world. You couldn't buy gas. Gasoline. You couldn't buy hair products. You couldn't buy medications. I remember when they opened up state pharmacy uh, as, a, as a law, uh, a change in the ordinance. We could buy pharmaceuticals on Sunday. We'd go into state pharmacy. They had a big soda fountain where you could buy hamburgers. It was closed on Sunday. The entire store was dark. The only department you could get into was the pharmaceutical department in order to buy prescription drugs. That was the only thing you could purchase anywhere on the Lord's Day. We have such a better world now. Things have improved so greatly now that we decided that materialism and, uh, and more success and more ability would make money. Our economy is doing so much better. Come on. <laughs> and our future looks so much brighter now that we decided we'll live a seven-day work week and make people work on Sundays. I know that you're some of your livelihood. You have to do things. It's a different world. It's a different planet. I'm not <coughs> suggesting that every person who does this is wrong or wicked. So you're in law enforcement. You're in public service. And you have to work on the Lord's Day, etc. But I would suggest to you that we're very careful that we make the Lord's Day the Lord's Day all day long. Amen. We ought to be in the house of God uh, 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 other than uh, 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 unusual, extenuating circumstances of life. We ought to be in the house of God every time the doors open, but especially on the Lord's Day. He said, I will give God the first day of every week. Secondly, he said that I will give God not only the first day of every week, I will give God the first hour of every day. That's what Mr. DeMoss said. He said, I'm going to give God time every single day. I do not mean that it's a 60 minute time frame. He didn't say that in his book. But he said, I want to give God the first few moments of my morning. I want God to have me when I'm still fresh. Somebody say amen to that. Uh, when my mind is still clear. And you and I, if we're going to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, we'll have to decide, I'm going to put Jesus first by seeking Him in the morning and spending time with Him first hour of the day. Imagine this, ladies, uh, how your wife feels. Uh, if you come home, you know, talk to her, you know, fellowship with her, and say, well, that's what I do. <laughs> well, that's because you need some help and some training. You don't let her know how special she is, yet she doesn't talk to you. Imagine this, fellas, your wife gets up in the morning, doesn't say hi, gets out of the bed, leaves the room, goes off for her day, walks around the house for an hour, walk by, good morning, dear. <laughs> and that cat keeps on walking, and you say, well, that is how she acts. I know. That's why we're in such a mess. Amen? Uh, we ought to spend some time together communicating, uh, planning our day, talking about our day together. And don't you think it's so much the more in our relationship to God? Uh, so much more rather than immediately uh, checking our email or checking on the world financial trades. They're going to be there when you're done praying. Uh, it, the email is not going to change. Say amen to that. The outcome of the football game is going to be the same whether I check it first thing in the morning or not. I mean, folks, God wants us to spend time in His presence. Amen. 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 
Psalm chapter 42, verse 1, uh, As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. In Psalm 30, 63, verse 1, He said, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee to see thy power and thy glory uh, as so as I've seen thee in the sanctuary. You know, God wants us to seek Him in the morning. Amen. I can honestly tell you that since I heard that challenge from Mr. DeMoss, and when I read men of God like E.M. Bounds and read about the lives of Jonathan Edwards and read about the lives of D.L. Moody and men that impacted their generation for the cause of Christ and John Hyde of India and Robert McShane of Scotland, when I read men of God saying that their great secret was the fact they gave God that first part of every day of their life, they got up and had devotions, they prayed, they saw Him, I started reading about them and I said, you know, I'm going to do the same thing. I had a man recently up in Maryland, I, I preached this message. He's called me probably seven or eight different times in the last three weeks and said to me, hey, I haven't missed one day. It's changing my heart. It's changing my life. He called me the other day with some questions about the Bible. He said, I've been reading through the Bible and I'm not real sure about this and that. When people call you with a question about the Bible and they're not being a smart aleck, well, yeah. you know, so, uh, here's where the Bible contradicts itself. No, I mean, they call you and say, hey, preacher, what does this really mean? And you start explaining this. Yeah, I understand. I like to hear calls like that. I like getting questions like that. And by the way, so does God. Amen. God loves for us to call upon His name. Amen. And so, to seek Him, uh, number one, the first day of every week. Number two, the first hour of every day. I went in a man, his name was Jim Tatum, years ago in Jacksonville, Florida. He had a large clothing company. He was a very wealthy man himself. Has done much for the cause of Christ in missions around the world. And uh, somebody said, you need to go by Jim Tatum's. And he's got a big clothing company. And if you're an evangelist or a missionary, he has a warehouse. And you can go in there and buy clothes at about probably five cents to the dollar. I said, that sounds good to me. I went over to meet him and I called and let him know I was coming. He said, come right in to his office. When I walked into his office, I noticed on the door a little sign. It said, Mr. Tatum has an appointment with God from the hours of 12 to 1 each day and cannot be disturbed for any reason. Thank you for understanding. When I went in and sat down in front of Mr. Tatum's uh, desk, uh, he said, have a seat. He had a nice couch there. He came out from the seat uh, from his behind his desk and walked around and talked to me and shook my hand. And he said, where are you from? I told him, where's your ministry? What do you do? I told him that as well. And he said, uh, now, young man, uh, I perceive that you have a heart for the Lord. And he said, I want to have a time of prayer with you if you don't mind. I said, I wish you would. We prayed. I mean, Pastor, he put his hand on me, old-fashioned style, and prayed for me. And I sensed the power of God upon that man. I sensed the presence of God in his life. And I said, Mr. Tatum, what does that sign on the door mean? He said, I read about Daniel, how that he prayed three times a day. He said, years ago, I had taken a challenge from a man named Arthur S. DeMoss. I said, I have that little booklet on the secret of the success. And he said, I've always sought the Lord the first hour of the day. But then God challenged me later on in my Christian life to seek Him in the morning and then seek Him at night before I go to bed. And then I was reading from Daniel how that he sought the Lord three times a day. He said, that's what I do. I have an early morning devotion. I have a middle of the day devotion and prayer time. And then at night I pray before I go to bed. I seek God three times a day. No wonder Mr. Tatum is successful. I have an amen. No wonder God used his life. He passed away with cancer. God took him home. But how God still uses that man as a legacy to support the work of God literally around the world. First hour of every day. First day of every week. Thirdly, to put Jesus first, the first dime out of every dollar. The first dime out of every dollar. So somebody needs to just, you know, kind of say amen. Right? amen. It's certainly the right place. You see, it always comes down to money. You've got to believe it. People think about money just about more than any subject. Do I have an amen? That's right. And, and you better believe it always comes down to money. It always, it's just a big part of our life. Study the Bible. You'll find the New Testament is full of references to money, whether they're positive or negative. Study the Old Testament, uh, full of references to money and offerings and giving to God. And understand, if we're going to make Jesus first, we're going to have to get over some things. Number one, tithing is still for today. 
Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. 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 I've heard some of these ridiculous newfangled Bible teachers. Well, praise God, tithing passed away with the Old Testament. No, it didn't, friend. Come Jesus on. advocated tithing. He just simply said, you and I as God's people need to give a whole lot more. Uh, tithing is the beginning place of giving. It is the basis of giving in the New Testament. And so we ought to give not just tithing. We ought to do more than that in the cause of Christ. But it all begins right there. The Bible said in Proverbs 3, 9 and 10, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruit of all thy increase. Verse number 10 of that chapter starts, starts to talk about our barns being full and bursting forth with plenty. In other words, as we give to God, God has made it very clear that He will give back to us as we learn to honor Him. So the first day of every week, the first hour of every day, Number three, the first time of every dollar. Now, I heard Dr. Lee Robertson say this. I'd like to repeat it. I heard him say it on a number of occasions. How many of you know who Dr. Lee Robertson was? He passed away a few years ago. Great, stat, uh, just, just a statesman for God. God used him to start Tennessee Temple University. He's a great place uh, of training laborers for Christ. Uh, preached all over the world. A great man of God. And I heard Dr. Robertson say this as late as when he was 93 years old, still able to preach some and get around. And he said this. He said, I'm an old man. And when you hit 93, I guess you can say that and nobody argues with you anymore. <laughs> if, man, I'm 52. If I say I'm old, there's some people who say, wait a minute, brother. I'm 65. You ain't old yet. So he went to that. But I mean, he was old. And he said, I'm an old man. And he said, I've traveled this country. And I've traveled the world. And he said this. He said, I've been traveling doing preaching this thing for many, many years. He said, I've never seen one person who tithes and honors God but God has fed every one of their needs. Right. Right. Well, that's a big statement. He said, I've never seen one person who tithes, and he added three to five, come to church three times a week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. He said he's never met one person who was faithful to God. But God didn't meet every one of their needs. He said, what about the recession? What about it? The last I read, God is still on the throne. Hey. Is there a recession? Yes. Are we facing a tough economy? Absolutely. Is it going to be a tough time? Has it affected people in this world? Well, it's affected me. So, uh, there's one. How many of you have been affected in some way by this economy? Can I see your hand? I have some investments and whatnot. I got my portfolio in last week. It was not encouraging because they send your portfolio in for the quarter before. And I saw that. I oh, this is terrible. We all lost some money last year. Mike, stand to lose some more. But I got a question. If we've got treasure in heaven and we've given from a right heart to God, will the interest rates on earth ever affect it? He said if we get back here and both now and in this lifetime, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold in, in this life and in the one to come. That's what God talked about. I know I've got at least some 30% interest going on up there in heaven. I might have 60, and I might even have some of my investments of 100 where I've tithed and given to the Lord's work and then gave for somebody else or gave for a special project or gave for a special need or seen somebody that had a need in their life and helped them out personally. I think sometimes uh, that, that it's so good because the need is great and our heart is right that God even gives us 100% compounding interest daily. I believe that's a lot of money. Amen. Say amen. So amen. we need, as God's people, to realize that it's not all about this world. It's all about the one to come. Amen. It's not about this life. It's all about the one we're all facing perhaps very soon. How many believe that we may in the next few years in America if we may engage in a nuclear war. It's possible. I believe we may be hit with another terrorist attack. Very possible. Who knows what's going to happen after this inauguration that you have to have HBO to watch. Isn't that crazy? Say amen to this. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, uh, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen in the days ahead? Who knows where we're going to be heading uh, with America's future? But I know this much. We have a God who's still able to Amen. Amen. We have a God who's still able to meet every need in our life if we'll simply put Him first. First day of every week. The first hour of every day. The first dime of every dollar. 
You say, seek ye first the kingdom of God, it means to give Him first choice Amen. in every involvement. It means whatever we get ourselves involved in, we say, Lord, if you want it, I'll be a part of it. If you're not in it, I will not be a part of every involvement in my life. 1 Corinthians 10.31 Whatsoever you do, whether you eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the what? We need to ask ourselves, does this glorify Christ? Right. And if not, friends, we need to lay it aside That's if right. we're putting Him first. That's right. That's right. We need to set it aside if He's really going to be first place. That's we right. need not to watch it. We need not to listen to it. We need not involve ourselves in it if it would uh, if it would hinder us from putting Christ first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's good. And Amen. so first choice. You say, I don't like that kind of preaching. Of course, you know, our flesh does not like right. putting Jesus first. That's right. Right. Our flesh wants to have preeminence, not Christ. That's right. Our feelings want to have preeminence. What we see other people doing wants to have preeminence. At the uh, beauty salon and the, and the song, and all the girls turn off the hair dryers, that's my song, girls. And they all start crying together. You ought to be in the South. I mean, in the South, oh, that's my song. And they all start crying at hair dryers uh, around uh, the South. I don't know if it's like that here, but is that what we ought to let guide our life? Should those principles guide us? See, no. I want to have, I want Christ to have the first choice in all of my involvements. Amen. Finally today, the first priority, the first place in every decision that we make for Christ. Amen. But I can tell you folks that when I started living my life this way, I started looking at all that I was involved in. Guess what? There were some involvements. There were some priorities. There were some things that I was in that Christ had no part in. I had a very good job when I got saved. And now for the first time, I was actually beginning to make money. Before I got saved, I would make a, a large paycheck on a Friday night. And by Saturday, and by, by Monday, I was borrowing lunch money from the men that worked for me. I was their foreman, and I was borrowing 10 bucks uh, for the week to pay them back. You say, $10 for the week? How do you remember when $10 would get you through most of the week? That's right. Not anymore, but it was a good day. And and twenty dollars for the week, and I'd pay them back on Friday night. And as a kid, uh, 19, 20, 21 years old, I was making twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars a year, thirty-five thousand dollars one year, and I knew that my future was secure uh, with the company that I was with. I would be a part owner and, and be a millionaire right now. If they all became millionaires, that's where I'd be. But God called me to preach. And Amen. God called me to serve him. And I went to my boss and said, God wants me to go to, to, to church on Sundays, first day of every week. God wants me to go to church on Sunday. And once in a while, I need to make a prayer meeting, and Wednesday night, and Bible study. I need to start putting more of my life in church. You know what the boss said? He said, you'll have to make your mind up. You're either serving God, and you're either serve, or you're going to serve this company. He said, you're either going to be into this Jesus stuff, or you're serving this company. And that boss got angry and cursed me and said, make up your mind. I said, it already is. I'll give you a 30-day resignation. He said, you can't quit. I said, no, you just forced my hand. Do I have an amen to that? Amen. I said, I quit because I decided I'm going to live by this principle. And then God has called me to preach. Was I going to live for preaching? Or was I going to live for the world? Was I going to live for things? And there were lots of opportunities. I could have married a young lady whose dad had a big construction company. And he said, all you have to do, you can work the construction company by uh, all during the day. You can own the company and it'd be a preacher on the weekends. It's going to be great. But friends, that's not what God called me to do. God didn't call me uh, to build buildings during the week and then preach on the weekend. God called me to preach 24 hours, 7 days a week to be in the ministry. Well, have an amen. amen. There is such a thing as being called to a ministry. And there have been opportunities along the way, many, to swerve from this calling, to swerve from these principles. And there have been opportunities to say, well, we're broke. We can't tithe. How can we give to God? We don't have enough money. You know what I would answer to that? You have to give to God. You need to give, you need to, give to God because you are broke. <laughs> Amen? You need God to get back on your program. You need to get on His or you're not going to make it through. There was a time not long ago, this past year, when I was very sick 
and, and very poor financially, the worst condition I've ever been in at any time, and God spoke to my heart. I had a little bit of money, and God just said, hey, what about me? What about putting me first? I put the money in the offering plate, and folks, within 48 hours, God so miraculously turned things around. It was incredible. You know why? If we just seek Him first and His kingdom, all these things shall be added unto us. And the very boss that was so angry, I used time up in the beginning of the sermon uh, unwisely, but I'll close with this. The very boss that was so angry with me was my oldest brother. They were mad at me because I was saved. They were mad at me because I no longer used alcohol. They were mad at me because I had said some things about their favorite sins. By the way, people love you to get preached to them. Amen? And then they're all for you being saved. And you say, well, what about you? Boy, they got angry. They got mad. And the rumors flew in the family. We go to family gatherings and all turn their heads and wouldn't look at me and just walk away and just mock. You know what happened eventually? One by one, those family members started coming to Christ. Amen. They started getting right with God. They started getting right with each other. The very one who said, you need to make your mind up, it's either God or this company, that very brother calls me at least once a week. He called me four or five times this week. He called me the other day. He said, what are you doing? He said, I'm just four. I thought I'd call you and talk to you. How's that? And uh, he called me. And, and it always gravitates to this, this church. <coughs> Bible reading, what God's doing with it, what God's doing with His wife. It's amazing how God changes people's hearts. You know what happens, folks? All we need to do is seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. My son Lewis is here. Lewis, seems like we have some pretty nice things in our home. We've got a beautiful home God's given us to live in. We have beautiful cars that we drive. We don't drive junk around. we got nice things for Christmas. We, we always seem to have enough. There's tight times, but he'll be in Bible college somehow or another uh, this week, and all that will uh, transpire. You know what? All we need to do, folks, is seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you.